After we have studied the relation between stopping times and martingales, let us now address the question if a martingale converges at t goes to infinity, and if so, what can we say about the limiting object? And in this context, an important notion is a so-called upcrossing of an interval. So what is that? So you give yourself a stochastic process, which I would like to denote by x. And I give myself two real numbers, a and b, where I would like to assume that a is strictly less than b. And then I say an upcrossing of the interval a, b occurs um, if there exist two time points, t prime and t, taken from the natural numbers including zero, with the property that t prime is strictly less than t, if the following two properties hold true. First of all, at time point t prime, the process should be strictly below a, whereas at time point t, the process should be above b. And moreover, at every time point s, in between the time points t prime and t, the process xs should be in the interval a b. And I would like to denote by this uh, object u capital T x and this interval a b the number of upcrossings of the process x of the interval a b in the time interval uh, 0 t. So intersecting with the natural numbers including 0 since we are considering discrete time processes. And this number of upcrossing will play an important role. So here are a couple of remarks. First of all, the number of upcrossing is a random variable. Why is that the case? Well, you can also formulate that definition of an upcrossing of an interval in terms of a sequence of stopping times. So you could uh, define a sequence of stopping times um, in such a way that you, uh, let's call it by sigma t uh, or sigma k, the first time point, uh, the process is below b, uh, above b, whereas by tau uh, k, I would like to denote the stopping time that the process is below a. In that way, you can also encode the upcrossing, the number of upcrossing up to time t in terms of the number of stopping times which you can observe up to time t. Uh, here's a trivial remark, obviously, the number of upcrossing of the interval uh, AB by the process X in the time horizon 0t is bounded from above by t. So we have here a bounded random variable. And moreover, uh, the map that maps little t to so ut x a b is monotone. And we would like to use that property later on. So in the first uh, statement is a so-called dupes upcrossing lemma. And it tells you the following. So if you give yourself a super martingale, which I denote by x, and you give yourself two real numbers a and b, such that a is strictly less than b, and a time point capital T in the natural numbers including zero, then it holds true that the expectation of the number of upcrossing of the super martingale x of the interval a b in the time horizon 0 t is bounded from above by the expectation of the negative part of the difference between the stochastic process at this maturity at this terminal time point capital t minus the value a divided by the length of the interval so let us have a look at the proof so, and this proof again relies on the construction of a suitable bounded previsible process. And it is defined in the following way. For little t in the natural numbers, I define ht when t is equal to 1 simply as the indicator function that x0 is less than a. And for any time point which is larger or equal to 2, I define uh, the value of ht simply as the indicator function that ht minus 1 is equal to 1 times the indicator function that xt minus 1 is less than or equal to b plus the indicator function that xt is uh, minus 1 is equal to 0 times the indicator function 
that the process at time point t minus 1 is less than a. So what does that process do? Uh, let's have a look at this picture here. So you see, um, uh, let's say I, I start the process um, x uh, at time point 0, let's say in 0, uh, and this should be over here. So here are my real numbers a and b, and so these green lines are the barrier I have to overcome. So in that situation, you see since x0 is less than a, so from that time point on, this process ht is equal to 1. How long is it equal to 1? Well, it is equal to 1 as long as the process is below b. So this random variable switches to 0 whenever the process x exceeds the level b. So and this occurs for the first time at that time point. So you see, in that interval, the process ht is equal to 1. So and from that time point on, you see then we have that condition fulfilled. So you see, you see that indicator function is then 0. However, this, uh, so this indicator function is 1, sorry. But this indicator function is 0 because we have to wait until the process drops below a. So and this is, occurs at that time point over here. And then the, uh, the story repeats. So I have n again ht equal to 1 until the process exceeds this level b. And then h is again 0 until I'm below a. And you see it could be that up to the terminal point it never ever again in, uh, reaches the level b. So this is the way how this process ht is defined. I come to an, an, an economic interpretation of that later on. So what you can observe here is the following. First of all, it is clear that ht is bounded. Well, why? Because it only takes two values, either it's 1 or it's 0. Moreover, it's predictable. Why is that? Well, it only depends on the process at time point t minus 1, meaning that this process ht is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra f t minus 1. Hence, we have a predictable process. So we can ap again apply theorem 1.19, which tells us that in case that x is a super martingale, this discrete stochastic integral is again a super martingale. And now we can simply compute its expectation at time point t. So the expectation of this stochastic integral at time point t is then by the super martingale property bounded from above by the expectation of this discrete stochastic integral at time point zero, and this is zero by definition. So and this inequality holds true for any t in the natural numbers, including zero. Let us have now a look uh, a closer look at this discrete stochastic integral and we would like to derive a lower bound in terms of the number of upcrossing of this interval a b. So since this holds true, this inequality of any time point, let us focus on the, uh, on the case when t, little t is equal to capital T. So I would like to consider uh, this discrete stochastic integral at time point capital T. So by definition, it's nothing else but the sum n equal to 1 up to capital T of hn times the increment of the stochastic process, or in our case of the super martingale. And now you see how I can get a lower bound on that object. Well, you see, hn is equal to 1 until we exceed the level uh, b for the first time. So this means, uh, so assuming that we start here in 0 and 0 is below a, you see we have h, uh, t is equal to 1 up to that point, meaning we have here 1, and then we have here simply the, the increments of that process, meaning that we have here a telescopic sum. And you see what matters here is the value at that time point where we exceed the level b, um, minus uh, the first time point uh, where we below a. And in that first bit over here, and that's carry catcher, it's the time point 0. And you see the difference of that process, so meaning x at the time point when we exceed 
uh, b and this time point zero, of course that is uh, bounded from below by the length of that interval. So in that way we get as a lower bound for that first bit over here, simply the length of the interval a b. So we neglected, so to say, that part over here. So then this thing repeats, so we have to wait until it's, uh, below zero. Here we have no contribution because then uh, hn is equal to zero. So at that time point on, ht uh, is equal to one again. So and you see now it repeats, we get here again a telescopic series for all time points up to that time point where the process exceeds the value b. And we can estimate that um, the increment between the, the process, the position of the process at the time point when it exceeds level B and the position of the process at time point where it's below A. Remember that we have a discrete time process. It does not mean to be that the trajectory is continuous. So it could be that we are slightly below and slightly above and below A and slightly above B. That's why again we can bound that from below by the length of the interval. So in that way and we get the length of the interval times the number of upcrossing of that interval as a lower bound. So what remains is the last bit. You see, uh, there's, there might be a time point where the process drops below A, but then until the, uh, the final time point, capital T, it does not exceed the level B anymore. So we have to take now the telescopic uh, sum of that part over here, which gives me simply um, the value when we are below A minus the value where the process is at the, the final time point T. So in this part, this gives us a negative distribution. I would like to write that in this form. This is minus A minus XT in case that XT is less than A. And you see, I can also write that bit over here as a negative part of the difference between the position of the process at cap time point capital T minus A, uh, which we would like to use later on. So in a way, that bit over here is lost at time point T. So now it's rather simple what we should do. We simply take expectations. So we plug that thing over in here. And you see then we have, this is a deterministic number, it goes out from the expected value. What is left is the expected value of the number of upcrossing minus the expected value of the negative part of the difference between the process at time point capital T minus A. Now you simply solve that, so bring that uh, term on the other side and then you see the theorem is proven. So let us come to, to an um, economic interpretation of that strategy. So you can think of that as a kind of trading strategy. Let us go back to this picture. Imagine that this curve, so that um, is trajectory of our super martingale models um, the price of a stock. And then it might be a good trading strategy to say, well, I buy uh, one share of the stock when the uh, when the price is below a and i sell it when the price is above b so i keep it until the price exceeds the value b and then again i wait until the price drops below a i buy the uh, one share of the stock i keep it until the price exceeds the level b and you see in doing so i always whenever the, uh, i see this kind of up crossing i I get a positive payoff, namely this difference, at least this difference, b minus a. And now you see, well, that's, a, that's one of the strategy. I can make money out of that. I simply have to wait all the time until uh, this process uh, does this kind of upcrossing. Uh, but you see, um, this, uh, imagine this uh, process x describing the price uh, process of this uh, stock would be a martingale then we know by the martingale transform that this discrete stochastic integral is a martingale, meaning that the expectation of this discrete stochastic integral equals the expectation at time point zero, which is equal to zero. Meaning, even though it looks like as if we can gain money out of that, since 
we get a pos positive payoff whenever we exceed that interval, um, this expectation is zero. Well, why is that the case? Well, since we stop in, at, at a deterministic time point t, this time point t could be as here in this caricature, this capital time point um, capital T. And you see, it could be that the process is below A. But we have bought the, the stock at that time point. So me, meaning we have lost here a couple of money because the value of this stock is way below the price we have uh, bought the share. Well, and now you see, well, this uh, Martingale transform tells you, well, it compensates all the uh, the benefits you got from the upcrossing of the profits below. So meaning that process in expectation drops so dramatically at the end that it's, it eats up all the, the money you gain before. So this is also the called no system uh, theorem in a way. Okay, let us come now to a trivial corollary of that theorem of the stoop upcrossing lemma, and that's the following. Again, I consider a super martingale denoted by x, and now I would like to assume that the super martingale is L1 bounded. So what I mean by that? So we know uh, that if x is a, a super martingale, we know that the expectation of the modulus of xt is finite for any time point t. But now I would like to assume in addition that not only the expectation of the modulus of x t is finite for every t, I would like to have a uniform bound, meaning I would like to assume that the supremum over all time points of the expectation of the modulus of x t is finite. And by that I uh, denote uh, on this, I understand under an L1 bounded super martingale. Moreover, I define uh, u infinity of um, x and a b uh, as the limit as t tends to infinity of the number of upcrossing of this super martingale x of this interval a b up to time point t. And you see, since we observed that that quantity over here is monotone, we know that the limit uh, u infinity exists. It could be possibly infinite, but it exists. Moreover, I give myself uh, two real numbers a and b, again with the property that a is strictly less than b. And then the following holds true, namely that the expectation of u infinity of x and a and b, meaning the number of upcrossing on this infinite time horizon, is bounded from above uh, by the modulus of a plus this uh, one boundedness norm, namely the supremum over all t of the expectation of the modulus x of x t divided by the length of the inter interval. So what does it tell me? So if the expectation of the number of upcrossing on this infinite time horizon is finite, this simply means that the probability that infinitely many upcrossing occur is zero. And this is somehow uh, surprising, isn't it? You have that process which goes up and down all the time. So it's a kind of super martingale, it's a stochastic process. And still you know that for any interval you give you, you, and you only see a finite number of upcrossings, p almost surely. So it could not be that the process fluctuates quite a lot. And it's a quite surprising uh, observation which we made here. And you see the proof is rather simple. Um, so it relies on that theorem, I come to that in a minute, and the following observation. So let us consider for a given t in the natural numbers this expectation of the negative part of x t minus a. And you see I can simply use, uh, uh, bound that from above by replacing the negative part simply by the modulus. That's an upper bound. And then I simply can use the triangular inequality, which tells me then that I can bound the expectation of the modulus of x t minus a by the modulus of a, which is deterministic and can take it out from the expectation, plus the expected value of the modulus of x t. So this I have here. And then if I can take now the supremum over all t on both sides, I get the following upper bound, namely that the supremum 
of um, all t in the natural numbers including zero of the expectation of the negative part of x t minus a is bounded from above by the modulus of a plus the supremum of all t of the expectation of um, the modulus of x t. And by assumption we know that the modulus of a and uh, this random variable or this uh, deterministic number over here is uh, finite. So now let us see what we get from this loops up crossing lemma. So on the one hand we know that the expectation of the number of up crossing of the super martingale x of this interval a b up to time point t is bounded from above by the expectation of the negative part of the process x at time point capital t minus a divided by the length of the interval. So let us now take um, the limit as t tends to infinity. You see by the observation we made here if we can bound that expectation uh, by simply this expression, namely the modulus of a plus the supremum of all time points of the expectation of the modulus of xt. So in that way this upper bound is independent on capital T, so the limit does not play any role anymore. On the other hand, we also observed in the remark before that that quantity ut is monotone. So now we can uh, a monotone and we also know that ut is non-negative, meaning that we can apply the monotone conversion theorem which allows us to interchange the limit as capital T goes to infinity and the expected value. And in that way we simply obtain the expected value of the number of upcrossing in this infinite time horizon. And then this corollary is proven. Let us come now to the uh, to Dupes uh, super martingale conversion theorem. So you see from this uh, corollary we just discussed, uh, we observed that uh, this process, so a super martingale cannot cross any given um, interval infinitely often. So this hints at the fact that maybe this process will converge. And this is exactly the statement of that theorem. Namely, if you give yourself uh, in L1 bounded super martingale, again denoted by x, then the statement is the following, then there exists an f infinity measurable random variable, which I would like to denote by x infinity, and this um, random variable is integrable, and uh, it holds true that our super martingale xt converges at t goes to infinity to x infinity p almost truly. Meaning that indeed our super martingale will converge, however, uh, co however the limiting object is still a random variable. However, we know that this random variable is in L1. So let us have a look at the proof. So let us first define uh, the following L infinity measurable events. And this I would like to denote by C, A, B, where A and B are real numbers with the property that A is strictly less than B. And so this um, event C, A, B is defined in the following way. It's the number of, uh, or it's the set of all omegas such that if you consider the lim inf as t goes to infinity of x t omega is less than A. So you consider here all the time points where the process is below A and you s intersect that event with the event of all omegas such that the limb sub of x t omega is above B. And obviously since you have here x t below A and here x t below B, this, e this intersection of these two events are contained in the event of the number of that's the number of upcrossing of our super martingale x of this interval a b in the infinite time horizon is infinity. Moreover, this uh, this intersection of these two events tells you that the process cannot converge, right? Because the limb inf is below a, the limb sub is above b, a and b are different, hence no convergence can occur, 
because if the process converges, then the limb in should be equal to the limb sub. Moreover, I would like to define this um, event capital C simply as the union of all rational numbers AB such that A is strictly less than B of this event CAB. So what do we know now? So by, by the last corollary, we know that the probability of uh, the number that the number of up crossings is equal to infinite is zero, meaning that the probability of the event uh, uh, CAB is also finite. And as a consequence, um, since this event capital C is constructed as a countable union of these events CAB, and all these events have probability zero, hence we know that also the event C has probability zero because the countable union of null sets is a null set. So moreover, we know that on the complement of this event, namely uh, the complement of this event C, the process converges. So hence we know, since the complement of the event C has probability 1, we know that the process XT converges, P almost surely, uh, to some random variable X infinity. So what do we know by of this random variable x infinity? Well, uh, since xt is ft measurable, by definition, recall that x is a super martingale. We also know that xt is f infinity measurable, by definition of the filtration. So hence we know that uh, any element in here is f infinity measurable. So this immediately implies that also the limiting object, so me is f infinity measurable. So hence we have found here an f infinity measurable random variable to which the process converges p almost truly. For, so the last thing we have to show is that this uh, random variable x infinity is integrable and this we would like to do now. But this proof is rather simple. It's a corollary or direct consequence of Fatou's lemma. So why is that the case? Well, so we know this object x infinity converges. By Fatou's lemma, so then it converges means that also the limb inf converge. So by Fatou's lemma, we get an upper bound if we take that limb inf out of the expectation. So in that way, we get the expression that the limb inf as t goes to infinity of the expectation of xt is an upper bound for the expectation of the modulus of x infinity. But now we can do something uh, um, rather dramatically. Namely, so far we have not used that our, oh, we have only implicitly used that our super martingale is L1 bounded. So let's that use again. So simply bound that object over here by the supremum of all t in the natural numbers, including zero, of the expectation of the modulus of xt. For sure, that is an upper bound of that side. And then we are independent of little t, so the limb inf does not occur anymore. And by the assumption that our super martingale is L1 bounded, we immediately know that that quantity here is finite, which immediately implies that our random variable x infinity is in L1. And this concludes the proof. So here's a nice corollary of that uh, convergence theorem, namely in case that x is a non-negative super martingale, then we immediately know that xt converges to an x infinity p or more truly where x infinity is an L1. So you see if we have a non-negative super martingale, we can drop the assumption of L1 boundedness. So why is that the case? And this is a direct consequence of the super martingale property. Why? Now you see, if I compute the expectation of the modulus of xt, and I use that xt is non-negative, I can drop the modulus sign here, so that's the same. So I have here now the expectation of xt, and using the super martingale property, I know that this expectation is bounded from above by the expectation of x0. 
But since we have a super martingale, we know that expectation of x0 is finite. Since this inequality holds true for all t, I can also take here on that side the supremum over all t. And you see you have a uniform upper bound in terms of x0. Hence, we know immediately that our super martingale, which is non-negative, has to be L1 bounded. And so the assertion follows from Dupe's convergence theorem. Uh, here is a remark you might wonder if we have also different modes of convergence. You remember we on, here we only discuss convergence p almost surely and you could ask yourself what about convergence in L1 or in any uh, p? Uh, and you see uh, or you, you remember that almost sure convergence need not to imply L1 convergence and on the other hand L1 convergence need not to imply a pure almost sure convergence. So we need an additional ingredient and now you might, might think well but maybe L1 boundedness having this kind of uniform uh, control could be sufficient um, that also our process um, converges in, uh, in, L, uh, in L1. So you, if you think in terms of um, Lebesgue's convergence theorem. However, this is, this is not uh, the case. And the example we discussed with this Martingale gambling strategy in example 1.17, you can see as a kind of counterexample. So our next goal or our final goal will be to get sufficient conditions which also tell us something about uh, convergence in in some LP space. But before doing that, uh, I have to introduce um, the following object to you, which serves then as um, one important object to prove uh, the so-called dupes maximum inequality, which will then be the tool to address the question of L1 or LP conversions. So what is the running maximum? So you give yourself uh, a stochastic process X and then I would like to define the running maximum process. So that's a process now and I denote that process by X star and this process is defined in the following way. X star of T is simply the maximum of the modulus of X0, X1 up to the modulus of XT. So here's a caricature of what the process X star of T will do. So you see, suppose that blue pass, uh, as a, this blue curve is a pass of this process xt. And then you see what does this maximum process is doing? Well, if this process increases, then also it increases. But if the process then goes down, it remains on that level until you go to a higher value. And uh, so higher value here means in modulus. So here I, our um, caricature of this process seems to be non-negative. So you don't see um, also an increasing of that process if that um, blue process, um, since this blue process is always positive, uh, it could also be that this process increases if that blue curve be, drops below zero in such a way that the modulus becomes larger than the running maximum at a previous time point. Well, so our question or the question I would like to address now is uh, how does this running maximum behaves if the underlying process X is a martingale? And that's the statement of Dupe's maximum inequality. And this tells you the following. So if X is a martingale or can also think of a non-negative sub-martingale, then the following holds true. If you give yourself a parameter lambda, which should be larger or equal to zero, then it holds true that the probability of the event that uh, the running maximum up to time t exceeds the level lambda. So if I multiply that probability with a factor lambda, then I can bound that from above by the expected value of the modulus of the process x at the terminal time point t times the indicator function 
that um, the running maximum up to time t exceeds the level lambda and you see by dropping since this is a non-negative uh, random variable uh, I can bound that indicator function simply by one so I get this trivial upper bound namely that this event over here is bounded from above by the expected value of the process at time point t. So this kind of inequality you have seen already in the context of a usual stochastic process or a sequence of random variables because this, this is just the version of um, Markov's inequality. The difference here is, is a slightly subtle, namely on that side, we have the maximum over t plus one random variables, namely recall that x star t is simply the maximum of um, of uh, the modulus of x0 up to the modulus of xt. Whereas on the other side, I simply have um, the expected value of the process at the terminal time point. So if you simply would say, well, that's just Markov inequality, then you would get here also x star of t. So that's not the typo that I forgot here star. This is really part of the statement that you can replace for martingale or a non-negative sub-martingale, this maximum over here, by the value of the process at the terminal time point. So let us have a look at the proof. So and I claim that it suffices to do the proof in the non-negative sub-martingale case. Why is that the case? Well, so if x is a martingale, then by Jensen's inequality, you immediately know that the modulus of xt is a sub-martingale. And hence, uh, we only have to worry or consider non-negative sub-martingales. So let's assume that. So and then for a given lambda, which is non-negative, let us define the following stopping time. Namely, I define tau as the infimum over all time points t larger or equal to zero, such that xt exceeds the level uh, lambda. And I take the minimum with respect to t. So recall that deterministic times are also stopping times. We know that this infimum of t larger than zero of xt larger than lambda is a stopping time and by lemma 1.3 we also know that the minimum of two stopping times is a stopping time. Hence we know that tau is a stopping time and moreover we know also that tau is bounded. Why is that? Well obviously this random variable tau is less than or equal to little t. So now we can apply exactly Hans optional stopping theorem which was for uh, sub martingales uh, and bounded to bounded stopping times. So what is our second stopping time? Well, simply this little t, this deterministic time point. So and then we get from that theorem, which was theorem 1.21, that's the expected value of x tau is bounded from above by the expected value of xt. On the other hand, I can also write the expected value of x tau by simply writing the times one here as the sum of two indicator functions, namely that x star t is larger or equal to lambda and that x star t is less than lambda. And now let us have a look at uh, the following, this first uh, expected value. When we know that is running maximum is at time point t is above lambda. So this means that there has to be a time point between zero and t such that our process is above lambda. So this means that also x tau, so that tau occurs uh, up to time t so that this event, this event here occurs. So this means simply that we know that x tau is simply uh, larger or equal to lambda. So we can get a lower bound by replacing that random variable here to bound that random variable from below by lambda. And then the expected value of this indicator function simply gives us um, the probability that the running maximum up to time t is larger or equal to lambda. And now you see we already have proven the theorem. Why? Well, 
And so subtract from uh, this inequality is simply that term. And you see, we get that lambda times the probability that's running maximum up to time t exceeds lambda is bounded from above by that expectation over here. And as we observed already, if I neglect that indicator function, I simply get the expected value. And that's part of the statement. I would like now also to derive um, and sta a statement um, for the expected value of um, the running maximum up to time t. So before it was a statement about uh, the probability of the event that the, the running maximum is above lambda. Now I would like to have an expected value of this running maximum. And that's so-called Stoops LP inequality. So what is the statement here again? Let x be a martingale or non-negative super martingale and I give myself a p which is strictly larger than 1 and that's important. And then it holds true that the expected value of the running maximum up to time t uh, to the power p is bounded from above by this number over here p divided by p minus 1 to the p times the expected value of the modulus of xt to the power p. A couple of remarks here. You see immediately why we have should assume that p is strictly larger than 1. Otherwise, that upper bound would be trivial. Why? Well, then you have here simply an infinity. So if p tends to 1, this, convert, uh, this quantity over here diverges to infinity. And then we simply have a, tr a trivial upper bound. Moreover, I would like to uh, address your um, attention to the following thing. We have not assumed here in that theorem that our process is in LP. So it could be that also that expected value is fi uh, infinite. So in that situation, we do not obtain any decent statement. However, this inequality is still true, but then we have maybe on both sides. Uh, so, okay, then the statement is simply, simply trivial that that quantity is bounded from above by infinity. Well, we know that this quantity in there uh, are non-negative numbers, so we know that the expectation exists, but it could be infinite, so it's not a strong statement. This inequality becomes a strong statement in case that the expected value of x t to the p is finite. Let's keep that in mind um, and uh, you understand why we have to treat the proof in, in the following way. Okay, here's a proof. And again, it suffices to consider the case that x is a non-negative sub -martingale. So, and I would like to fix uh, a number capital K and then I would like to consider the expected value of um, the running maximum up to time t minimum capital K. And then I take of that random variable the power p. So what I would like to do now is the following. So I can rewrite that expression over here also with the help of a Lebesgue integral. Namely, I can also say, well, that's nothing else but the integral from 0 to um, x star t minimum k of p times lambda to the p minus 1. Why is that? Well, integrate that object. Uh, then you get um, simply, so that's a simple and usual integral. You know uh, what is its value, namely it's a function lambda to the p. And if you plug in now this uh, um, interval boundaries, then you see immediately that you get that expression over here. So what I would like to do now is I would like to rewrite that uh, integral in the following form. Namely, I would like to get rid of the stochastic process in the upper integral bound. And this I can do in the following way. I simply uh, write here an indicator function that x star t, so that's the running maximum, is larger or equal to lambda. So this means that you integrate in lambda only up to that value and that you see is exactly uh, also expressed here with, its, with this upper bound. And this minimum k is here given in terms of the 
upper integral bound. So you get in that way the following integral. And now I would like to use uh, Fubini's theorem, which allows me to interchange these two um, um, uh, integrals. And in that way, I simply obtain the integral going from 0 to k of uh, p times lambda to the p minus 1 uh, times uh, the probability of uh, the event that the running maximum up to time t is larger or equal to lambda. And you see why I'm allowed to apply uh, Fubini's theorem? Well, you see that object over here is finite. And that's the reason why we also introduced here that, that truncation by k. So we know that if this um, uh, integral here is finite, we also know that that expected value is finite. And this we also know from here. This expected value is also finite. So we are allowed to apply Fubini theorem. So what I would like to do now is I would like to apply now Dupes maximal inequality. Let's go back. So the maximum inequality was a statement that if I have lambda times the probability of the event that's running maximum up to time t is larger than lambda, that I can replace that by that expectation over here. So let us borrow from this lambda to the p minus 1, 1 lambda. So that's why I get here lambda to the p minus 2. And then let us replace that lambda times this probability of that's running maximum exceeds the value lambda simply by the expected value of xt times the indicator function that the running maximum up to time t is larger or equal to lambda. And now you see what I would like to do now. I again apply um, uh, Fubini theorem to bring exactly uh, the integral this p and this uh, lambda inside the expectation. So you see that quantity does not depend on that integral of a lambda. The only term which depends on lambda is this indicator function. But this then looks like that, except from the fact that we have here now lambda to the p minus 2 instead of lambda to the p minus 1. So if you now do the Lebesgue institute, well, so you get a prefactor, and the prefactor is exactly the term p divided by p minus 1. So in that way, I obtain that expression. And the other difference is that also I get here the exponent p minus 1 instead of the exponent p. But now we are almost in business. Well, you see, I would like to get that term out here with the exponent p. So this tells you immediately you should apply Hölder's inequality. So I apply Hölder's inequality uh, with uh, the term p and the Hölder dual is then the term p divided by p minus 1. So in that way I get on the one hand the expected value of the modulus of xt to the power p and this whole expectation to the power 1 over p and on the other hand I get the expected value of um, uh, the minimum between the running maximum uh, of x um, uh, up to time t minimum k to the power p, so y p. Recall that the Hölder dual is p divided by p minus 1. So the p minus 1 will cancel out and the p remains. And you see you get here outside the expectation exactly the inverse of that Hölder dual, namely p minus 1 over p. So what have we gained by that? Well, you see that expression appears on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side. So we can solve uh, for that expression. So we bring that term on the other side. And then we simply obtain the expression that as the expected value of the running maximum up to time t minimum k to the power p is bounded from above by um, p divided by p minus 1 to the power p uh, times the expected value of xt to the power p. So what is left is to get rid of that minimum k. But you see, if k tends to infinity, that object over here converges monotonically. Hence, and moreover, it's non-negative. Hence, we can again apply 
um, the monotron convergence theorem, which allows us to interchange that limit with the expected value. And in that way, we obtain here uh, simply the expected value of the running maximum up to time t to the power p. And on the other side, I simply get what is in the statement, namely this um, factor p divided by p minus 1 to the p times the expected value of xt to the p. And this closes then the proof. Let us come now to uh, the, the answer of the question if we have also convergence of our super martingale or martingale towards a random variable in some AOP spaces. And indeed we have that. However, not for p equal to 1, but we have to assume a slightly more integrability. Namely, let us fix some p larger than 1 and let x uh, be an LP uh, martingale. So an LP bounded martingale, meaning that now the expected value of xt to the p and the supreme over all that is finite. So I assume on the one hand that all these expected values are finite. In addition, I have also that uniform bound. And then the statement is the following. Then there exists an f infinity measurable random variable which has a property that, uh, which I could denote by x infinity and which has a property that it's now in LP such that the process xt converges to x infinity, p almost surely, and in LP. So you see, you only, so only for p equal 1, L1 convergence does not hold, but for any p larger than 1, this LP convergence holds true. Well, okay, so uh, uh, how does the proof go? Um, so first of all, uh, we know uh, by uh, Jensen's inequality that x is LP bounded. So that's this quantity holds true over here. That's trivial. Uh, and on the other hand, um, so uh, sorry, that x is L1 bounded. That's crucial. Um, why? Well, you see, if you apply Jensen's inequality uh, or you use Hölder, then this, this quantity that's the supreme over all t from the expected value of xt, you can bound from above by the supreme over all t of the expected value of xt to the p. And from that object, we know that it's finite. So that's what I wanted to say. So hence, we can apply Dupes, maximal, uh, Dupes martingale convergence theorem, and first of all, to, con to obtain an f infinity measurable random variable, which is first of all in L1 of p. And we know that xt converges to x infinity um, p almost surely. So what have we to show now? First of all, we should show that x infinity is not uh, only in L1 of p, but also in this LP space. So how we do that? So first of all, it's it's trivial remark here that uh, the modulus of xt is bounded from above by the supremo of all t of xt. This, this is an, an upper bound. Moreover, we know that the expected value of the supremum of um, xt to the b, p, I can also write um, as the limit as t tends to infinity of the running maximum of um, uh, x, so of this process x star t to the power p. Why is that the case? Well, this process over here in t is increasing because you take the maximum over large and larger sets of non-negative random variables, namely the random variables xt to the p. So you can also bring that p over here inside the maximum. This does not change anything. And since you have an increasing sequence, this limit equals to the supremum over all t. But now we can uh, use uh, Fatou's lemma, which tells us 
uh, since you know that this um, that we can bring out the inf from that expectation to get an upper bound. Hence, we have here first of all the lim inf of the expected value of x star of t to the power p. But now we can apply uh, the lp, dupes lp inequality, which gives us immediately an upper bound of that object over here. Namely, that simply this prefactor p divided by p minus 1 to the power p times the expected value of the modulus of xt to the p. And now you see I can make that quantity even larger by also taking the supreme over all t um, in x0. Hence we obtain an upper bound which is finite. So you see here is the, the crucial difference. We started here with the expectation of the supremum and by um, dupes LP inequality we ended up with the supremum of the expectation that we can control. So that's the crucial difference uh, and for that you need exactly this LP inequality, dupes LP inequality and you see why you don't have um, or why you cannot conclude immediately from L1 boundedness of a martingale the convergence in L1 because you fail to prove such a kind of um, uh, estimate. So once we have that kind of estimate we are in business because now we can simply apply Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem which gives us immediately uh, that we can interchange uh, the limit as t goes to infinity and the integral. So what do we have here? So we have that the expected value of uh, x infinity, the modulus of x, x infinity to the power p, which is nothing else but the expected value of the limit as t goes to infinity of the um, modulus of xt to the power p. Now we can apply, since we, this is a p almost sure convergence, we have an integrable upper bound. So hence we can apply the dominated convergence theorem, take that limit out. Then we have that object over here. But that object over here, again, we simply can bound uh, by the supremum of all t. Then this limit does not play in ro any role anymore. And we know by assumption, by this boundedness in LP, that that quantity over here is finite. And this shows that our random variable x infinity indeed is in LP. So what is left? Left is to show that we not only have a p almost sure convergence, but also a convergence in LP. And for that I would like to consider the following random variable. Namely, I consider um, the modulus of xt minus x infinity to the power p. Since we know that xt converges to x infinity, p almost surely we also know that that sequence of random variables converges to zero p almost surely. So what is left is, again, we would like to apply uh, Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem, hence we should construct an integrable upper bound for that random variable over here. So how to do that? So you see, I would like to use Jensen's inequality again, in a smart way, to get an upper bound of that difference to the power p. How do I do that? Well, um, in which way, so in order to apply Jensen's inequality, you need a probability measure. So what should be my probability measure? Well, it's simply the uniform measure on these two random objects, namely xt and x infinity. And the uniform measure I choose is simply by dividing by two and multiplying by two. So, and then if I divide that thing by two, I can think of that as an expected value. So, and uh, this, uh, to compensate this dividing by 2 by this factor 2 gives me exactly this 2 to the p. So, and then I can simply use Jensen's inequality, which allows me to bring that p inside this difference. And this gives then um, uh, this factor uh, xt 
t to the p, so the modulus of x t to the p plus the modulus of x infinity to the p. And since we had a probability, we divided by 2, but this 2 I neglect. And then I make it even larger by simply taking the supremum over all uh, t. So what do we know? By assumption, we know that um, this process xt is LP bounded, meaning that that random variable over here um, uh, is finite by the reasoning we have used over here. Moreover, we also know that x infinity to the p is finite by the observation we did over here. So hence, that random variable is indeed in L1p. So it's integral. So hence, we can apply Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem, which then tells us the expect that the expected value of the modulus of xt minus x infinity to the power p converges simply to zero. And this concludes then the proof.